And I would like to invite Ms. Brown to use this dyna dynamic and to give us some information about what's happening in the UK. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to talk about open research data in a DIS perspective, because it sounds very loud from here. Um, I've got quite a few slides, so I'll, I'll go straight on. And um, basically, I'm going to talk about JISC and what JISC is as a UK organisation, and then look at some of the papers um, produced over the last five, six, seven years which put research data at the more the forefront of some of the, the GISC work, look at some of the principles that came out from various UK research councils and then move on to some of the GISC work that, that has been done and is being, doing, is, is being done now. So it's sort of past, present and future, really, of research data from a GISC perspective. And, and like I said, Christopher Brown. So GISC is basically, we have a, a, a vision and a mission, quite grand, to make the UK the most digitally advanced education and research nation in the world. And we work with higher education, further education and skills in the UK, looking at uh, international practice, modern digital empowerment. Uh, I'm not going to go too much detail, but this week there was a paper um, from the Higher Education Policy Institute published a report about the hidden advantage for education about JISC. So that sort of does a good um, overview of, of JISC. But we deliver in, in four main areas, really, which is digital content, looking at sort of cost-effective access, I suppose, particularly relevant to, to libraries and EPFL, onto the UK's richest collection of digital resources. So we enable that through the UK Federation for access to various resources. Important part is, is the underlying infrastructure. So the Janet Network, which links the universities in the UK, is funded by JISC, and that enables services and collaboration on, built on those infrastructures. We offer advice to our members, because we've currently moved, we, we are still funded by, by research councils, um, but we have a membership model now where our institutions are funding us, so we represent our members. So we offer advice to those members and guidance and tools, saving the sector quite a lot of money. And particularly, the area I'm most interested in, the area I've worked in for the last six years within JISC is in the research and de development area. So this is where looking more at the innovation work, identifying emerging technologies, developing them around our members' needs and testing them, knowing them on their behalf so they don't have to do it. So we're doing that work for them. And the idea is that by funding projects that can be moved into a service, we're doing this for the benefit of the UK. So we have our strategic framework and our impact areas. On the outside of the impact areas, and you can see at the heart of that are our customers. Particularly relevant to, to this presentation and, and today is really the, the, the top left, so it's the, and the top, the data analytics, the open agenda, which enables collaboration and internationalization. That's a long word, isn't it? And um, so that's, that's, like I said, a brief overview of JISC, and there's, there's, more, there's links in there if you want to find out more about JISC as an organization. But I thought I'd start on the research data by looking at actually a definition of it. So the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council definition is about research data is defined as the recorded factual material commonly retained by and accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. And interesting, it's, it's, some of this is in digital format, but it's, it's not really the, that just digital data. There's a lot of data which isn't stored digitally. Obviously, that might talk mostly around the, the, the digital data. And Creative Commons about believing that scientific data should be freely available to everyone and calling this open data. So just really promotes this concept of open access, open research, and, and which enables open science. So it's not just about the data, it's about enabling, by enabling open access to the data, we're, we're promoting science and making it more open. So there are a number of things that actually stop research data from being open. I'm not gonna list all those on the left, but there's a sort of summary of some of these, these things that make data, I suppose, appear closed. And, and with thanks to Kevin Ashley for some of the responses here for some of the, the why, pe why researchers don't necessarily allow their data to be o open. Um, and there's some comments there about, you know, people ask questions. I know that's quite a good thing, I would have thought. Um, worried about misinterpretation of their data, but that's what being o making the data open allows for correct correctness and correcting any errors. People feeling it's not interesting. Um, that's, that's sort of um, 
up to the interpretation of the individual, I suppose. And, and I suppose that there's the focus on trying to get a paper out of that research uh, and permission for sharing it. With, you know, it's not the research. Who owns the data? Is it the research? Is it the, the institution? And some people just don't see it as a priority. You know, they've done the research, they've produced their results, and that's it. They don't care about... Well, they do care about the results, but the, but the data is sort of seen as sort of one step on the way to producing results. And unfortunately, it's, it's not just that. It, 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 you, you can't repeat that, those results without accessing the data. So, you know, you want it to be able to be repeatable, and also you can correct any errors um, and it proves that you've, you've, you've done it correctly. And there's been a n number of um, things like Climate Gate in, in the UK, where sort of looking at the, the, the data from um, climate modelling as, as, um, and then checking that data against the results and proving the results were actually inaccurate. But, <clears throat> but moving on. So back in 2009, uh, this is based on Jim Gray uh, from Microsoft about this fourth paradigm, which was, that, you know, we had empirical, theoretical, computational research, now looking at data exploration and that the, the, the discovery of new science through this large, well, as, as mentioned in the previous talk, there's, there's massive amounts of data being captured by instruments and large hadron colliders, space data. So we're entering this sort of fourth paradigm of data-intensive scientific discovery. Now, Bill, from that, um, I should probably hear later, is, is the, the, the European Commission report on, um, well, the high-level expert group on scientific data submission to the European Commission back in 2010 about the need for a collaborative data infrastructure that can enable researchers and other stakeholders to, to reuse and exploit the research data. So, yes, there's a lot of research data being produced, but we need to have this underlying infrastructure that allows the reuse and you know, collaborative projects from that data. So, and there's a quote from um, the European Commission from the, you know, the potential benefits are enormous, and, but there's also a cost, because, you know, who's going to pay for this? So we need to have these right, the correct foundations and need to start quite soon. Now, JISC is actually part of a group called the Knowledge Exchange, which is now five partner organisations in Finland, Germany, Denmark, and SURF in the Netherlands. At the time of this report, though, there was four, which is why it says four. It's not an error on the slide, because Finland only joined recently. So this was looking at that um, European work and trying to look at the present situation with, with regard to research data in those four countries and producing an outline for possible action. And this identified four key drivers about, around incentives, you know, the incentives for researchers to publish their data and their data sets. Researchers need training in the new skills that are required for creating, handling, manipulating, and analysing that data. As I've mentioned, we need the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure to support the, the preservation of the data, and also the funding, because you know, these things don't come free. Science, the Royal Society produced this open enterprise report about the, the need for, to conduct and communicate science to adapt to this new era of information technology. And it was a call for really for all science literature to be online. And again, you know, this is about open science as well as open data. And, you know, for all this data to be online and the science and the data to be interoperable. So they, they identified six key challenge, challenges in the report. And whereas in the past, data had seen as, you know, the private preserve of the researchers, the research group or the institution. This is sort of moving away from... So it's a, a culture change to make this data open and expand the criteria to evaluate the research and giving credit for the for useful data communication developing common standards for communicating the data mandating an, an intelligent openness for data related to scientific papers and also you know this is i suppose relatively new dis, um, job roles as data scientists and sort of strengthening the, the number of data scientists that are needed to manage and support the use of digital data and also, there's a lot of talk about data and the science, but there are software tools that are required to automate and simplify the creation and exploitation of data sets. I'm not going to go into it this talk, but you know, the preservation of those tools is equally important, in, in my opinion. So the GISC was involved in uh, an open data dialogue report with um, the Royal Society, as I mentioned, and ScienceWise, about exploring the views on open data, data reuse, and data management policies. And this was really designed to provide insight on the business issues that this dialogue would support 
to, 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 to help with the um, future development within JISC of, and the, the projects that should be funded within JISC and the work that should be done. So this is building on previous work in this area and, and the wider policy framework. And also, importantly, engaging with people in this area, talking to the public, and to, testing out principles. And I'm going to come to some of these principles in a minute. In a minute. So, as I mentioned, <laughs> Research Councils UK started producing these principles on data policies. You know, why should researchers, research groups, preserve their data, you know, policies and guidance? Well, I mean, some of these seem quite obvious, but I suppose, you know, they need to be stated. So, it, obviously, it's for the public good. If research councils, it's publicly funded money on research data. The pu there's a public interest. In it. There's, there's no reason if you're... Well, you, well you, there, there is in a minute. I'll give, give some examples. But um, it's in the public interest that the data should be, should be made open and, and as few restrictions as possible. It needs to be preserved so it can actually, you know, be around in five, ten years' time. As mentioned in the previous talk, <coughs> excuse me, the, the metadata that allows the data to be discovered is, is equally important because, you know, you have these data sets, you need to be able to find them, which is quite obvious. And going back to this confidentiality thing, you know, that there are certain legal, ethical, commercial reasons that sometimes data might not be, need to be open, like the personal data, medical data. But it's important that research groups and researchers don't just use this as a, sort of a blanket coverage for I'm not going to reach my, reach my data, release my data because it's confidential. Think about that first use, you know, allowing exclusive use for research teams to publish their results before it's made open. Recognition for the, for the users of the data, of the, the, the data sources and, um, and how to access that data. And again, public funding, use of the public funds for research data management infrastructure is seen as appropriate. Um, so it's not always just the institution that has to pay for this, but the research councils are funding it as part of the, the, the funding that they're giving for the research. Um, a yeah, slightly complex diagram, not going to go into too much detail. I put this up really because it, it, it sort of, it's a nice diagrammatic form of, of showing the commercial, secure, and on the top right, the open data and the research and how the sort of various types of data. So we've got data from uh, Bioinformatics Institute, um, square kilometre array, medical bioinformatics. So you see the medical information, clinical practice data gets more into the securely held data and, and then the sort of more open data on the, on the top right. So it's sort of different types of data. So an another um, research council, as I mentioned before, the engineering physical, engineering physical research science, engineering physical sciences research council. So I'm so used to saying acronyms, it's sometimes hard to ex expand them. Um, about the expectations from research organisations, about promoting the internal awareness of these principles. So when you're publishing research papers, you need to indicate how the supporting research data that underlies those publications can be accessed. You know, the research organisations need to have the policies and the processes in place that can maintain awareness and the access of publicly. So it's not just allowing access, it's actually maintaining the, the awareness of, of the data sets. And if it's non-digital, that data has to be stored that can still be shared on request. So it's not just allowing a digital information to be accessed, it's, it's the non-digital stuff as well. And again, the importance of metadata, describing the data that needs to be published and freely accessible. If it is restricted, there has to be the reasons and the conditions that need to be satisfied to get access to the data. They need to ensure the data is, so it's the research organisations have to, the onus is on them to make sure the data is securely preserved. And, and it's quite an important thing about the minimum 10 years from the last access, it's not the 10 years from when it was created, it's from the 10 years from the, the last time that that data was accessed. So that could be potentially quite a long time. And it needs to ensure that the, the, the effective data curation through the whole data life cycle and adequate resources provided for the creation of publicly funded research. Now, there's a roadmap that was put in place in 2012, and, and organisations, research organisations that are funded through EPSERC have to be compliant with these principles by May 2015. And, and one of the things this does is, is help uh, research organisations to sort of comply with those principles and be compliant. So, again, more principles of open data from the US and UK Open Data Summit this year. Discovery, talking about data, data meta, metadata and computer code, again, not just the, the data, that's used in evidence for a published paper or equivalent must be discoverable, so it can be easily found, must be accessible, 
intelligible, so it's easily understood, uh, as accessible, so the provenance and reliability of the data is understood, and reusable, so because you know it's not just the the the, 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 the researchers um, that are reuse, that using the data; it's allowing other researchers to reuse that data and discover new uh, science, basically. So, and the data generated by public, public charitable funded research that is, is not used in evidence should also be made open. So it's not just the data that's used in evidence, but the, the, all the data that's been created. Um, if it's reused, you must formally acknowledge the originators. The, the cost of open, allowing data to be open is an intrinsic cost of research. It's not seen as something that's supplemental. It's part of the research. So that cost, which as I mentioned, is, is, inv is involved is part of the research. And again, the reasons for commercial sensitivity must be um, um, provided. And the existing process of rules, structures, behavior that inhibit or prevent data sharing should be reformed. So the, again, this, this culture that, that's in, perhaps in place in certain places has to be changed. And that's probably one, quite a big challenge. You, you know, you can make, have policies and guidelines, but you need to change the culture. So, as part of the knowledge exchange, JISC has worked with Science Europe to do this preliminary report of responses to, to certain Science Europe members. I thought it would be relevant, as, I mean, um, mainland Europe. Looking at examining the funding landscape related to, relating to research data infrastructure and research data management within Europe. This isn't actually going to be published till next year, but um, some of this work is going to help inform and direct some of the um, subsequent stages of research, um, particularly within the knowledge exchange part, so that includes JISC. Now, I'm going to just, I mean, it's a bit of a confusing diagram, but basically what, it, what it's saying is that if, it, if it's yellow, orange, or red, that, that's sort of further advanced in implementing some of these policies. So as you can see, the policy and strategy development is quite far advanced, but some, providing some of these services, like access and storage management, so that's, the more blue and green means it's, sort of, it's not really far, as far advanced as we would like. So managing change in research data management services design sort of, it has a long way to go. So it's really, the advancements has been more on the policy and strategy development. But moving now to, to actually why GISC looks at, um, has funded projects in research data management. The, this is a key area for GISC because research data management, it's all about research excellence and impact. Uh, research integrity, efficiency, and, and managing risks. So, Back in 2009, one of the first managing research data program, which ran for two years, was, was funded looking at five strands. I don't really have time to go into all this, but all the information is on the DISC website. Looking at data management infrastructure, planning, support and tools, citing, leaking, integrating, publishing research data, and training materials. So that ran for two years, and then following that, there was the Building Institutional Capacity, the second MRD program. So this is actually looking at institutional infrastructure services in the middle and the data publication projects, planning and training. And I've put a few um, icons in there for RDM, Rose and Mantra because they're mentioned in workshops later today. So just had, had spent a fair bit of money and time over those four years looking at research data management. And then we went into a period of transition, and I'm not going to go into the detail of transition, but now JISC has come out into more of a membership model, and um, I'm going to describe some of the new sort of funding processes we have, and the, what JISC is doing in this area. So this is a summary of some of the work we're doing, which I'm going to give examples of in, in some further slides, so I'm not going to really go through these in, in too much detail at the moment. But the, there's the Digital Curation Centre. Um, we're producing training materials, helping support on po open access policies, research data registry, the journal on research data policies. Um, actually, those are the ones I'm gonna give examples of in a minute. And preservation storage, cloud services, access and data management, we're working on standards and protocols, data deposits and reuse. And um, if you want a good summary, there's, which was published yesterday, which was I was updating these slides late last night, um, the, the research data management blog gives a, a, a nice overview from Rachel Bruce on, on the work that we're doing in this area. But I'm going to give, and, and this is a graphical presentation, representation, which I didn't produce, I have to say, but anyway, um, of, of those, that, that, that list of um, various products. So it's, it's, it's quite 
simple when you actually understand it. In that we have the data storage and archiving, research data management planning, data sharing discovery, and skills and training. And those are the projects. The blue ones are ones we've currently funded, and green ones we yet, haven't yet funded. So it, it's, um, it's quite simple, really. But I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to give some examples of some of, the, some of those projects. So the Digital Creation, Creation Centre was established by GIST to really help in building capacity, capability, and skills in research data management and creation across the UK, particularly the higher education research community. And this is the sort of support that they, the Digital Creation Centre offers. Um, some of the key ones, actually, are in understanding the data requirements. So there's a data asset framework to look at sort of an audit of your researched assets. And then you've got the cardio tool to look at um, you know, what, what you need to um, enable that research data. And then the DMP, Data Management Plans Online, is a tool for helping you create your data management plans, basically. And there's, there's a disk stand around the back with some handouts from the Digital Creation Center explaining this in a bit more detail. But one of, one of the new methods of funding, as I alluded to earlier, is um, this co-design method. We're working with our members to look at areas and various themes. And one of the main themes is research at risk. It's, it's, it's obviously research at risk. If you're not allowing your data to be open, that's a risk to your research. And in the bottom right there, you can see how it fits in with the strategic framework of, of GISC. But some of the vision, the vision and activities around that is, is realising a robust and sustainable research data management infrastructure and services that can enrich the UK research. So we're going to produce research data roadmap and toolkit for UK universities, um, filling in the gaps with the infrastructure, supporting university in meeting the funded compliance, like the episode one for May 2015, making data count, helping to change that culture, and promoting RDM good practice with Mantra, RDM Rose mentioned earlier, and shared research data tools and services. So some of the projects we are currently funding at the moment support is, well, supporting research and science. Briskit is a biomedical research data software kit based in Leicester. Um, this is looking at, obviously, sensitive biomedical information. So it's, one, it's that data that's a bit, you know, you know, can it be made open? And because it's sensitive and includes um, personal information. So it has to be on a secure, well, secure, secure infrastructure. So we're creating, just with, it's creating a sustainable, sustainable service with an open source software as an effective and competitive solution for the sharing of the sensitive information, the data between the medical groups that comprise this and other collaborators such as the NHS. So it's a secure storage area for this data. The General Research Data Policy Bank, at the moment we just have the feasibility study that this is, meets requirements. So the, the policy from the research councils are all stored centrally, so the um, universe, organizations and research organizations, researchers can access these policies in one place. One of the important things, of course, is the discovery of the data. So this has been piloted by the Digital Curation Centre already, modeled on what was being done in Australia. And this is allowing, a sort of, um, the, as I said, the data to be discoverable. And this is now going to move from a pilot to production in those timescales, developing the business case and the key use cases around this discoverability and working with the nine eight higher education institutes and the data archives in, within the UK to harvest the data from them and into a, into a registry so that, that that information can be discoverable. One of the things that hasn't actually started yet when sort of, um, will be launched in probably in a couple of weeks, next month, is this data experiments and prototypes looking at data curation, deposit and reuse, and basically coming up, asking people to come up with ideas in those areas and then funding various projects. And the priority areas are around research data deposit, sharing protocols and tools, data creation, deposit and reuse, it, the standards, analytics and shared services. And I mentioned the importance of infrastructure. This actually launched uh, in September, as it says there, supporting the requirements for academic research. So there are six um, of the UK's top successful scientific academic organisation. And this is working with, with the Janet Network to have the infrastructure in place provided by, actually there's some hefty funding in there, but Affinity provide the secure access and off-site storage. So there's the data center off-site and those six institutions. 
accessing the data and storing the data in that secure infrastructure. So that's really a summary and a very fast overview, I'm afraid, <laughs> of, of where JISC is within open research data and, and why we're there. Um, so if you have any questions? Thank you very, very much for this uh, state of art in the UK. Are there, are there questions for Ms. Brown? I have one. Um, I have one. Um, how the, do the researchers in the UK react to all of this? I mean, uh, researchers have to find money to fund their research. They have to publish. They have uh, overall to make some research, and now creating uh, research data can seem to be uh, another thing mm. to do. How do they? Well, it's it's part of changing the culture, and and of course there's there is a cost involved. So the the the, the research the funding councils provide money within the, the funding to encourage. And they have the, 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 the sharing of data, and they have the policies and the processes in place to, to, to enable that. But, it, but I think one of the important things is actually changing the, the culture, as you say. And hopefully we're, we're doing that by offering training and guidance and support, particularly through the Digital Curation Centre. So I think, yes, it will take time, and, it, and it's not just... Well, there's, there's a number of elements. There's the money to do it, but I think that the, the key thing is really just that change in culture to, and to encourage... And, and, there are a number of discipline, I mean, it's a cross-disciplinary thing, and there are a number of research groups that are keen um, in opening up their data. I'm not going to name any particular disciplines, <laughs> but some are, some are better at sharing than others. But um, I think, yes, it's, ch it's changing the culture first and then going from there. How many years? Uh, <laughs> well, I think we're already there, so we're on, on that journey already. So I think there will always be some people who are, uh, are not going to be keen on, on that open but um, hopefully in the next five years and by being by having to be compliant for the for the funding for the research councils by 2015 I mean in theory it should be in, in place by then but I think in practice it will take a few more years how would you measure success of your initiative oh gosh that's a good question isn't it <laughs> um, I think by having more data open and allow and having that, putting things in place that allow collaboration. So it's not just about oh you've made your data open and it's a, you know it's a, a checkbox you can tick the checkbox I put my data into a repository and now people can access it. So it's it's, it's that's I mean to me that's quite hidden. So you're like I say putting in the place for having the discovery of that data. I suppose you'd measure success by, find, by having more of that data that's open, discoverable, and then who's reused it and measuring it that way. But, but it's like I say, it's not just a tick box, I've, I've put that data on in a repository, it, it's now open, like putting your software onto SourceForge is, you know, is a tick box for I've you know, made my, so, my software open access, um, open sourced. It's actually encouraging people to actually reuse it um, promoting it and doing more science with, with that data. So, Right, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, this sounds very good. But then why, why do you say before that that you want to change the culture? I mean, you're providing a service. And the measure of the success that you just gave is a measure of how much the service is being used. Well, it, I mean, yes. the, the researchers are not dumb. I mean, if, no, if, no. if they're offered something, they will use it. Mm if it makes things move forward. So uh, as much as I absolutely like the answer that you gave to, 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 to my question, uh, I dislike, as a researcher, I dislike the wording change culture. I don't need anybody to come and change my culture. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I agree partly, but I also disagree in that, you know, it, it, when it, uh, it sounds, I don't, I don't think it's insulting by saying, you know, change culture in a bad way. It's just that, because 
most people I'm, I talk to and groups I engage with are very keen on being open. So it, it's just... It's, it's just those small, a small number of groups that feel that they don't want to share their data or, you know, they're just concentrating on the publications and, and the data is just seen as sort of, well, you know, I've stuck it in my... on some CDs and I've, I've backed it up. And, and it, it's that culture. So it's, I, don't, you know, I don't mean it as like the whole culture of the UK is focused on, you know, is anti-open data. It's, it's just that where there are sort of barriers to, to that openness. It's trying to remove those barriers. But perhaps that's a better way of describing it. It's, it's breaking down the barriers that stop research being, and science being open rather than... Well, and through that, if that needs a change in culture by, by providing training and the tools, then that's really what I mean by changing the culture. I mean, you must have noticed differences between disciplines, right? Yes. I mean, that's surely where the boundaries lie. I think so. And the probably are reasons why. I mean, there, there are areas where, open, where you can open useless stuff. I mean, some of the arguments that you gave and then gave an answer to probably are such that your answer has a counter-argument as well. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's not that simple. I mean, there are, it can go too far. And I think that the measure of success that you gave is ultimately completely correct. I, I fully agree. If people use it, it's great. If they don't, it's a waste of time. Yes, but I mean, I don't know, because I mean, if, if 90% of space data has not been used, I mean, uh, you, that's not been a waste of time that it was produced. Um, and there, there is an argument, because yes, if someone's never going to use your data, you say, what is the point? But then you don't know, because sometimes you don't know what people are going to do with that data until someone finds use of methods and, and comes up with new ideas to, to interpret that data. So, uh, yeah, there's that sort of grey area, I think, where you, you're making everything open, but only a small percentage of that is ever going to be reused. Um, and then, yes, if you're measuring impact and the benefits, maybe five years down the line you think, well, you know, 1% of that data has been reused. Why did we pre preserve the other 99%? Then there may be an argument for that. But then it's very difficult to know what data is going to be useful in the future. I mean, until that paper's published and then people come, come and want to reuse that data, I mean, I think it's... It's a challenge in a difficult area. But, but, but talking about disciplines, I mean, I've worked in areas like um, e-lab notebooks. Um, I'm not, I mean, this is in the chemistry area where, you know, there's, there's, they're, they're trying to, instead of writing down everything in your logbook, you know, you're doing it electronically and then you're sharing it. And that's great within certain research groups, but even just getting that to, down that sort of corridor within in the, the department, you know, by... It, People come along and see what they're doing, and then it spreads out. But then that's always been difficult to promote that wider across, with it, not just within the department, but within that institution and, and across other institutions, because there's, there's, there's that barrier between people changing their process and their culture, where they've you know, always recorded everything in a logbook, and they feel very attached and to that data. And this is the data, because it's, it's the record that they produced in doing their experiments. That's really what I mean about the culture, where people don't really see the benefits of sharing that information. They might even see the drawbacks. Well, yeah, I mean, there are certain drawbacks, like, and, um, you know, having, but if, if there's sensitive data and you don't, and it's, you know, working with pharmaceutical organisations, for example, there, there are reasons for, to keep in that, you know, having a time frame before it's opened and giving people, the researchers, time to actually do something with that data before it's shared. May I ask a question? Sure. Thank you, wonderful talk. I have a bit of a question on the moral and technical side. One is that I fully appreciate the need as a scientist to, if someone wants to share my data, not to put it on my own server, but somewhere that's public where I can, people can access it. So uh, what size of ser uh, servers do you have like, that can store lots of data? How does one approach to say, I just want to do a data dump on your servers Someone to share, or and how do you do QC metrics to measure the quality of data that's that's going to be put on your servers? Um, well, we're not really measuring the, the, the quality of the data. I mean, with the the um, we have the framework in place and using the Janet network, which is sort of connects up a lot of the institutions, well, UK higher educational institutions. The, the size that, that's available, I mean, is, is it was really limited. Well, it's not really limited because there's um, it's 
however much is needed or required by those research groups. So we have the framework agreement, which I mentioned in, in one of the, the slides, and, and the, the project working um, with Infinity, that project. So it's, it's providing that services. So it's an external, rather than having the, using your institutional infrastructure, you're providing the service. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what those limits are. I'm sure there are limits because you can't just give people sort of infinite storage capacity, but it's, it's providing that secure off-site storage. So it's not really the institution that has to worry about that, but it sort of, um, can be taken off externally. And, and by doing that, that should reduce the cost as well. But as for the quality of the data, I mean, that's really around having um, the right policies and processes in place to, um, and, and the quality of the data, I suppose, well, there's, there's the, the data that you produce. So it depends on the science, you're, on the domain you're doing. You, you know, you've got the raw data, you've got the processed data, and you've got the published information. And, and you know, I suppose there's an argument for preserving everything, or well, there's preserve, preserving the raw data or the processed data. But, but, but if you're publishing something, you need to have that core set of data and the tools used to, to produce that publication preserved as a, as a first instance. So, I mean, that really should... Well, it's not a measure of quality, but I think if you're producing papers based on that, that data, then that data has to be of certain quality. And if you're harvesting the metadata, that's sort of another quality check on, on that data. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question goes as follows. Um, UK is, I would say, the world-leading uh, country in open data, uh, maybe beside the US. And uh, you have uh, a wonderful open data website, data.gov.uk. And my question goes as follows. Uh, what, what research data is going to be published on data.gov.uk? And second, uh, do you also use the, the great uh, uh, open data platform framework, CCAN, for your purpose? Uh, to be open, I'm the head of a Swiss chapter of the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, well, on, on the open, for the discoverability, the, I mentioned the discoverability, the, re, the registry service from the Digital Creation Centre, that was analysing the Australian National Data Service, but it's also in, in the next part of the pilot leading to the production of a service, it's going to analyse CCAN as well, so and it's also working with our institutions to make sure that we analyse all the available solutions for that. I didn't quite catch the first part of your question, so... Um, well, that's, I mean, just, although we work with governments, I mean, we're not involved on the data.gov.uk, but, I mean, that's really for the publication of um, government data rather than the sort of institutional data. So, I have read a few comments which are more practical. So, you mentioned that uh, it would be good to for example, make some database in the labs where people can make all data of, of, instead of lab books. And imagine normally people are working some experiments, for example, five days in a week from morning to evening, and then you're basically running in the lab with your lab books and trying to catch up shortages of what you did that you don't forget. And imagine that you have then instead of it to stay in the night to write in the electronic form what you did. That would be, I think, from the practical point of view, impossible, or then experiments would be undoable. That's the first problem. Second thing is, when we want to make a publication, we have to analyze the data and how we do it. We typically meet our PhD students or we meet a team which did some work in order to try fast, efficiently, to come up with a solution. And imagine now that we cut off this and we do everything in the written form. It's impossible from the time scale to do it mm. today. Do, can you imagine now that we have to write down everything, every thought, every comment, every exchange information, mm. how we did it, why we did it, blah, 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 blah. So we try to put it in concise form in the publication and that is already open thing. And mm. there is also supplementary, so I don't understand the point why we should put uh, the way how we come up to that somehow more extended. Because if we put raw data, then you need to put a bunch of information 
what mm. are these raw data, what they mean at all, mm. how you measure them, why you measure them, what are your conclusions, how you thought of to come from this raw data to, to that what you come up at the end. So, I mean, this is first taking an enormous amount of time. And yeah. today, we don't have time almost to follow up the publication which are coming from our own domain, not to mm. mention to, to put, oh, but this is really true. It, it, it's, it's such a mess of the publications, and imagine then to put this online. And furthermore, I really don't know who would find the free time to look at such a open resources which you are proposing. Mm. There, I, I really, I don't, I, I would not find any spot even for weekend to do it. I don't know, maybe somebody who is not occupied, who doesn't have research project, who is completely free, and I don't know <coughs> where such a people exist, but if there are somebody, s s some researchers like that, then maybe they can find free time and look, oh, let's see what these people did, how they come up to this measurement. This would be really, for me, I don't know, unimaginable. Mm. I, 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 sorry, but maybe I have wrong the angle Let, of experimentalist, but. but I, 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 I don't think any of this stuff is, is, is really to sort of add to, your, to people's researchers' workload. I think it's in a way to try and you know, make it easier, like you know, doing the electronic recording of information in that e-lab notebook it was really sort of replacing the old the lab notebook way of doing it. It wasn't sort of like a, another way of doing it to add extra time. It, in a way, it was trying to save time and, and by sharing it, make it shareable, that would encourage collaboration. And I see what you mean. And yes, it's an extra... And I suppose this is probably about the change in the culture because it's not supposed to add to your workload. It's supposed to, you know, back up your publications and allow other people to sort of... So hopefully, explain sort of to reuse that data and 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 improve. You know, you can go back in ten years and say I produced this paper, and they say, well, where's the data? How did you produce that? Where are the tools that you use to to interpret that data? And say, well, you know, it's um, sitting on my CD or something, or backed up somewhere. You know, it's, it's making that accessible. And, um, and I suppose initially may that may add to your to the the time and the work. But I think in the long term. The, the benefits outweigh the, the, the negative things. But I can see what you're saying. I appreciate it. Hi. Uh, I've got another question. Uh, dealing with safety, security, and ethics. Um, we all know that knowledge is beautiful. Uh, but uh, for research, it's a much more complicated. It depends. Uh, in, uh, within an institute, industry, or anything, uh, in a structure, a uh, defined structure, uh, we could imagine that there are some limits, some constraints, ethical committees or anything like that. The very point of open data is that you don't know what will happen with your data, mm -hmm. what will people do with it. I am thinking about biohackers or anything that you can't control, and that happens every mm -hmm. day. And so I just want to know how you deal with that, with these, mm. these issues, safety, security, and ethics. Mm. Thank you. Well, I mean, before I, um, the transition, I was in access identity management within JISC. So, yes, I worked quite a lot of projects looking at the security of the data. And, you know, and, you know if you remove all the inf information from, about people, you can still sometimes get back and identify people. So, yes, there's a lot of work and projects in the UK looking at making sure it's anonymized and also if it has to be shared, like the example I gave, secure, um, it's, the access is secure. Um, I suppose the, the ethics around reuse of the data is, is quite a tricky one because I suppose if you are allowing your data to be open, you, I mean, it's allowing people to, to, to use it for other types of research and yeah, that is a sort of another, another gray area, I suppose. Um, Apart from putting in the, the guidance around, you know, how your data is reused and, and um, doing it that way, I think that's probably the only way you can sort of handle the ethics of, of data reuse. But I'm around all day if you want to ask any other questions. <laughs> Thanks again.